Okay, I'm going to give a shia today. Uh, I hope it's a fascinating topic. But before I start, I thought it would be very appropriate to just to mention a couple of words about Shiva Osva Tamas, which is the 17th day of Tamas, uh, which is this Sunday. It's really on Shabbos, but it's a Nitche, which means that it has been postponed uh, for the next day, and that is because you're not supposed to fast on Shabbos. So this Sunday is Shiva Osva Tamas. Uh, now, j- just to mention, because I think that's very appropriate, uh, but if somebody really wants, uh, I gave a much longer version of Shiva Osva Tamas if they want that. But in any case, um, the idea is, it's very interesting. <clears throat> you know, if you ask a Jewish person, what is the greatest tragic day in the history of Judaism? So almost everybody will tell you Tisha B'Av, and they would have a very valid point. Uh, the reason for that is because on Tisha B'Av, right, you had the destruction of the first temple, you had the destruction of the second temple, you had the destruction of, uh, of uh, Beitar, whatever. I mean, it, it, of course, it's, uh, we lost the divine presence amongst us, and the Beis Hamikdash, and so on. So there's no question that it is an incredibly tragic day. But believe it or not, the greatest tragic day in the history of the Jewish people, as well as the history of mankind is really Shiva Osaba Tamas, the 17th day of Tamas. Why is that? Because on this day, right, we know Moshe Rabbeinu went up on Shavuos to receive the Torah. We also know that the Jews sinned with the golden calf. And the manifestation, or rather the result of that, of the Jews sinning uh, with the golden calf, is that Moshe Rabbeinu, who was supposed to be the Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah, the son of Joseph, which is the beginning of the whole Messianic process, uh, right, could not in any way become the Mashiach ben Yosef, even though he was the real candidate. Because God told them, you know, Leich Rei, go down, because your nation has corrupted themselves which meant Lech, go down from your ability to be Mashiach, not just go down from the mountain, but go down because the nation has corrupted itself, and therefore you cannot be the Mashiach, because they are not worthy of the redemption. Uh, therefore, what does that mean? What it means is that the hole that the Jews had reached, the, they, they had completed the Tikkun process, and that is called Tiklach Kloli. That is called the complete or total rectification of the entire creation. Right, that's what the Jews had done in Egypt. A combination of doing mitzvahs, a combination of also suffering. And what was happening is that they had uh, been able to accomplish that task which is the ultimate and total rectification of creation. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu, in response, was the Mashiach ben Yosef, or he almost was, I should say, and therefore they could receive the Torah, which is the first tablets. But those first tablets were not just ordinary tablets. They were not like the second tablets. Those first tablets was the Messianic light, you see. <clears throat> and there are many indications for that, without going into it. But those first tablets that Moshe Rabbeinu, Luchas Rishonis, that Moshe Rabbeinu gave was the messianic light. It was the platform, the power source of the entire messianic light, which I'm not going, going to go into, as a result of the fact that the Jews had done the complete and total tikkun. Uh, so when the Jews did the golden calf, which was on Shiva Os Batamas, and therefore Moshe Rabbeinu, right, could not be the Mashiach ben Yosef, right? What that meant is that they had destroyed the entire concept 
of the Tikkun HaKloli, which is the total rectification. Now that meant that not only the Jews had failed in the end to bring the total rectification, but it meant that the concept of the total rectification, which is the essential task of mankind in general, because even non-Jews have a share in the total rectification, not directly, but indirectly, by assisting the Jews to do the tikkun. And that is the reason, or well, that's their connection to Ulam Habo. So this concept of the failure of the Jewish people to do the total rectification, thereby restoring some of what's called the Zoyamo, the defilement, the pollution of the Sutton, is the greatest tragedy in the history of the Jews and the greatest tragedy in the history of the world. Because if that's the purpose of creation, to do what's called the Tikkun HaKloli, the total rectification, and they almost did it. They were at the cusp, right, of the messianic light, and they failed. What greater tragedy is that, you see? So really, Shiva Osabatamas is the greatest tragedy that has ever befallen the Jewish people because it meant that Moshe Rabbeinu could not redeem the Jewish people and usher in the Messianic era, which is absolutely incredible. So it's not Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is clearly a Jewish tragedy. There's no question about that. Right? But Tisha B'Av is strictly the inability of the Jews to have their Beis HaMikdash, their temple. But the greatest tragedy is the inability of Moshe Rabbeinu to be the Messiah, to be the Mashiach, right? And to redeem not just the Jews, but to redeem all mankind. That is clearly the greatest of all tragedies. And like I said, most people do not realize that. That's uh, why Shiva Asabatama in many ways starts off what's called the three-week period, which ultimately leads up, of course, to Tisha B'Av. <clears throat> Second thing I'd like to point out is that July 4th, 1776, which is the date of the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson, which is the essential contract or statement of rebellion of America against England, and that's really one of the greatest documents ever written in terms of its expression of the freedom of mankind and certainly America, you know, Shiva Osbatamas was July 4th, 1776. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so the question we can ask is, what does that mean? And we can think that maybe it means this. Because July 4th, 1776, which was, as I said, the 17th day of Thomas, is the beginning of America, isn't it? But... Not the America necessarily that we know, because America ultimately is the forerunner of the Toiv Shebe Esav, which I have talked about extensively, the good part of Esav. Because if you remember, I said that Esav in the end repents, does tshuva, and he fulfills the prophecy of the older will serve the younger, Rav Yavoy Tzoyer, the older will serve the younger, and that, in the, in the end, uh, begins really the messianic process. Because Esau can only repent at the beginning of that process. In fact, that's when he repents. Uh, so therefore, July 4th, 1776, is Shiva Asa to tell you that the end of the Tikkun process, right, because of the sin of the golden calf, is really the beginning of the redemption. You think about that. Isn't that incredible? It's almost poetic. That the end of the process, really, of Tikkun HaKloli, when it failed, God is going to use that very day to begin the process of redemption by allowing America, the good part of America, called the Tev Shebe'esav, or the Tev Shebe'edoim, the good part of Edom, to begin to assist the Jews to 
do the tikkun. So that's a very interesting concept. What God does is that on the very day that it ends, which is the greatest tragedy of all, on that very day begins the uh, step toward the messianic process. Anyway, I thought I would leave you with, leave you with these two major concepts in terms of what we're about to face. Uh, one is that Shiva Sabatamas is the greatest tragedy in the history of mankind, not only the Jewish people, because it meant the failure of the Tikkun HaKloli to ensue, uh, but also the beginning of the redemption process. I think that's something really worthy of reflection. Uh, now, the question is a very interesting phenomenon. We find that many times there's a tremendous sense of hopelessness, utter despair before the redemption. In other words, the darkness is so powerful that it looks hopeless. In other words, we cannot even begin to understand how can we get out of this darkness. And we know what the darkness is, the evil, the corruption of mankind the incompetence of mankind, the overwhelming dominance of evil in the world. And it looks so powerful that we have this tremendous sense of hopelessness, or as I said, utter despair. Uh, the question is why? Well, first let me talk about some of the demonstrations of this idea. You know, a lot of people, they, they, what I want to say, everybody knows these historical events, but I don't think we realize, realize the depth of the meaning of these events. Let's take a look at Egypt. <clears throat> you know, the Jews are in Egypt for hundreds of years as real slaves. Now remember, Egypt is not just a country. You know, under uh, what's called Tutmosis, who was before Moshe Rabbeinu, and then you have Tutankhamun, King Tut, then you have Iknahitan, and then you have Ramses. Egypt became the greatest, most powerful nation of earth. You know, and they existed for 3,000 years. You see, could you imagine being a slave in Egypt? You know, and the slavery was terrible. In fact, the, the Torah even testifies. It says, Vayimoraru es chayehen, and they embittered their lives. So could you imagine the slavery in Egypt? Now, a slave is not a worker, right? He's a slave, which means really he has no ability to exercise any kind of freedom. And not only that, there's no let-up. It just never ends. From the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep, you are a slave under somebody else's dominance. You see... And there's no freedom, obviously. So, could you imagine the despair that the Jews had, right? Being slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. And what, what would they think? It's over with. There's no way that they can overthrow Egypt and leave. You know, because Egypt is the most powerful nation on earth. So, could you imagine what they were thinking and their feeling? So in other words, it gave rise to utter resignation that they'll never get out of this situation. A second idea which created a massive amount of the feeling of hopelessness. Imagine Moshe Rabbeinu, who is the agent of God, he's the Messiah, right? Uh, he comes to Paroi and he says, here's what God says, you need to leave, let the Jews, Jews go. Right? So this is the Mashiach, Moshe Rabbeinu, the messenger of God, the agent of God, saying to Paroi, you need to let them go. What does Paroi say? He defies Moshe Rabbeinu. In other words, he defies the Messiah. Right? And what does he say? Nope. These guys are lazy. That's why they're thinking of freedom. So from now on, not only do they have to gather 
or may, I should say make the bricks, they have to gather the straw. But when? If they cannot diminish the amount of bricks they make in a day, so when are they going to gather straw? And the answer is at night. And remember, there are no flashlights then. Could you imagine at the middle of the night, at 3 a.m., pouring through the fields of Egypt, trying to gather straw? Could you imagine the suffering that that entailed? And this went on for months, you see. So the real idea is not only the hardship, the labor, the intensive suffering that they had for months, right? But could you imagine that it was it shattered any hope? Because finally, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Messiah, the Mashiach of God, uh, to redeem them, comes to Egypt and faces Parah and says, let them go, right? And all of a sudden, Parah says, basically, they jump the lake. I'm not going to let them go. In fact, I'll show you who's boss. I'm going to make it much worse. Therefore, the despair that the Jews had was cataclysmic, catastrophic, because it meant that Pari was greater than the Mashiach, which ultimately means that Pari is greater than God. Because if you can defy his agent, clearly you're more powerful than God. Could you imagine what the Jews are thinking when they hear this? Uh, they lost all hope of redemption because even somebody sent by God is powerless against evil. Interesting, isn't it? So that's a second period of hopelessness. And then the third period of hopelessness is by the Red Sea. Yamsuf, or the Reed Sea, as they call it, Right? Uh, by the uh, Reed Sea. What happened there? Here, they're at the sea, and their back is against the sea. And all of a sudden, they look up, and there's the Egyptian army. I mean, this was not just an army. This was the greatest and the best charioteers and soldiers of Egypt. And what the Egyptians wanted to do is slaughter the Jews. Why? Because... You know, once they rebel, they're not going to come back to be slaves. So they've got to kill them, you see. Uh, so all of a sudden, you have the Egyptian army that's going to slaughter the Jews, which is a, a, a tremendous defiance again of God. Because of, after the ten plagues, they knew there was a God. And they knew that this God was almighty. Yet they still had in their mind to defy God. And to defy Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, you see? So the Jews are taking a look at this. And they say, we don't believe this. These guys are back again. You know? That means they were able to, in many ways, resurrect themselves. You see? And defy God. Which is incredible. You see? They thought they were finished. So that's the third situation. That they were utter despair. So the question is, Why? Why did the Bershom put the Jewish people in a way that they will have tremendous hopelessness? That's the question. We see that it happened at least three times in Egypt. Uh, but now we see tremendous hopelessness in the world. I mean, people walk around in the days. You take a look. America is no more a rational country. They have an incredible level of immorality where not only is LGBTQ, right, completely dominant, but it's the preferred way of living, right? And not only that, there's what's called gender flexibility, where you can actually determine who you are, you see, which is insane. You can deny your biological heritage and just say, I'm not a man or a woman. I'm whoever I want to be. In fact, they've even prohibited pronouns. There's no pronoun called a woman. There's a birthing individual. There's no he, there's no she. I'm not going to go through the whole litany of nonsense. But could you imagine what that means? You know, it's insane. You see. So you begin to realize this is hopeless. Because mankind has reached an insane level of thinking. <clears throat> How did this happen? And more important, how do you overturn this nonsense? Because there's so much of America 
right? Who's in America that's behind this? You have the, all the people on the left. You have all the liberals and the progressives. You have the whole Democratic Party that supports this craziness. You see, so you begin to realize how, and not only that, the Supreme Court in, 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 in the 2015 made this part of the Constitution, which you cannot overturn unless you have the majority of the state legislatures and so on, which of course will never happen. Uh, so it has become legalized. So how do you get rid of this? You don't. And that produces an unbelievable sense of hopelessness in America. Because if you think it's going to stop here, you are mistaken. It's going to increase. Eventually, just watch, incest will be legalized. If a person wants to marry his pet, he can do it. Uh, you, we're going to witness things that the immorality of which we cannot even dream of. And there's no way to stop it because you cannot discriminate against this according to the Constitution. Uh, not only that, but did you know that there was a study in London came out and they estimate there are 15.1 million Jews. So they ask, how many Haredim are there? How many Torah observant Jews are there? And the answer is 2.1. That means if there are 15.1 million Jews in the world and only 2.1 million Haredim, Torah observant Jews, that means 13 million Jews have nothing to do with Torah. Or if they do, it's on an incredibly superficial level. Could you imagine the tragedy of that? How in the world are you going to bring them back? How is God going to bring them back? We're not talking here about, you know, 5,000 Jews gone. We're talking about almost 90%, right, of the Jewish people are either unaffiliated, assimilated, intermarried. How are you going to bring them back, you know? For, so for somebody who is concerned about this, what well, happens? You get this incredible sense of hopelessness. There's no way that these people can come back. Then you take a look at Israel. You know, you have this terrible government, what's called the era of Rav, that does what? That wars, wars against the Torah and therefore against the Haredim. Could you imagine that? The evil of this government? They say this press government, right, under what's called Lapid and Bennett, is one of, it's probably the worst government opposing the Torah and Judaism that ever existed in Israel. How do you get rid of these guys? And did you know that there's 1.5 million kids in the public school system in Israel? What kind of an education do they get in Torah? Almost none. Or whatever they get is dominated by the reformed and conservative movement. So the question is, do you realize what a one and a half million kids are? It's the annihilation of the youth of the Jewish people. These are the future Jews. And they have no education, basically, of real Torah and mitzvahs. You see? And then the rest of Israel, basically, is secular. So the question is, how do you bring them back? You know, the overwhelming population of Israel is not, is not really Torah observant, even though some, many of them may be traditional, but there's a very superficial adherence to Judaism. I'm, po I'm pointing out the darkness. Then we take a look at the rest of the world, besides America and Israel. China, incredibly evil country that wants to take over the planet, you know, with their 1.4 billion people. But it's a terrible country, you see. And then you have Russia. And then you have Iran that wants to destroy Israel, and they say so, right? So they produce a tremendous existential threat. And Iran is going to get the bomb. There's no question about that. That means Israel is going to have to enter an existential war. How do you stop this evil, you see? Especially America is trying to help Iran regain its feet, regain its status. Like, what happened? This produces a tremendous amount of 
a despair, utter despair and hopelessness, right? Because not only, remember one thing, a messianic process involves two things. It has to stop evil, or it actually annihilates evil. That is step one. Step two, which is interesting, is that the evil must acknowledge that it was wrong. We find that by Esau, and the angel of Esau, we had to acknowledge that Yaakov was right, you see. That's what evil does. Not only does it have to end, but it has to acknowledge that it was wrong and only good is the way of behaving. So not only does evil have to disappear in these two ways, but it has to change toward holiness. Can you tell me how a world that is steeped in what? In materialism, in pleasure, right? How they are going to change toward righteousness and holiness. We have no idea that we know that the Torah says, uh, right, that it says in Nitzavim, Parashat Nitzavim, that even if you're outcast, which is the exile, be at the ends of heaven. Could you imagine what that is? You know, the Jews are spread all over the planet, which is amazing, that the only nation on earth, there's only 15.1 million Jews and they're all over the planet. They're all over the planet. So it says that God says, right, that He will enter Rishomi Kabetzcho. God will enter the Klippa, which means the Golas, right? Every country where the Jews are, He will enter and change the Jewish people. Yikabetzcho, which means He will gather them. <clears throat> and separate them from the Goyim. And then it says, Umisham, and from there, Yikochecho, God will take you, every Jew, right, no matter where you are, He will take you to Himself. And that's what it says. So what does that mean? Uh, that means He will elevate you in Torah, because that's what it means to come to God. Somehow, He will elevate the Jewish people in terms of the Torah. We have no idea how that's going to happen. And then it says in that Pasuk, Umisham, and then Veheviacho, and he will bring you to the land of Eretz Israel. Now the question is, how is that going to happen? You see, how can God change the consciousness of every Jew, no matter where you are on the planet? Right? Uh, that is the question. So when we think about that, we ask ourselves, how in the world can evil annihilate and the good holiness begin right it's way against what's called teva it is impossible to even think how something like that can happen right that's the incredible thing about all of this so the question of course is we realize that there's going to be an unbelievable amount of darkness at the end of time now I had mentioned in other shurim the concept of the windows, which Rabbi Moshe Chaim Ritzata talks about in the Maimah HaGu'ula. To repeat, what is that concept? That concept is this, that at the end of time, or I should say, that the Shefa, the divine influence or holiness or energy of God, comes down to a gate, huge gate. But with the destruction of the temple, what happened is that gate closed. The problem is if the gate closes, then the world will annihilate. So what did God do? He opened up windows, which are smaller openings. So right before he was able to shut the gate, he opened up the windows. So therefore the divine energy or influence, Shefa, comes through those windows. And therefore the world has what's called a kiyom. It has the ability to exist. Uh, but the problem is, is as the Jews sin, the windows, which are painted black, begin to close. Which means as they close, right, nothing gets through except for the space between the window and the threshold. But if it closes, that means less and less divine influence, energy, comes through. Uh, and as we get closer and closer to the messianic light, the windows close 
further and further. And this is the concept that when that happens, clearly evil dominates, right? Because that's what darkness is. Oh, you see, until finally right before the end, when the Mashiach comes, right before the windows, between the window and the threshold, is only one nanometer. That's it. And if that closed, the world would, the whole creation would disappear. Which, when you think about that, is amazing. But right before it closes, God opens up the gate. And there's this unbelievable quantity of divine energy comes out, and that's the messianic light, and then the window is shut. So because the gate opens before the window is shut, and nothing happens. On the contrary, when the gates open, there will be a, what's called an effulgence. There will be a magnitude of kedusha, holiness, of which we cannot even imagine. And that is the messianic light. <clears throat> But meanwhile, before it closes, or about to close, there's unbelievable amount of darkness, which is, of course, the proliferation of the, what's called Tikbir Surah, the proliferation of evil. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, why? Why does God do that? <clears throat> so part of the idea, okay, is that this is a result of the sins of the Jews. But there's several ideas which are important to know. One, God needs the Jews to do something to deserve the redemption. What is that? Well, the most imp- now, you have to remember, God is a shadow. What does that mean? That God follows the actions of a human. In other words, if you believe in God, then God will interact with you. If you don't believe in God, you believe in yourself, He will not interact with you because you are the one who determines what he does you see so therefore what God needs the Jewish people to have bitochen which is faith that you believe God exists right and you believe not only God exists but God will redeem you and keep his promise if a Jew is biteach if a Jew believes in God that what happened is God says, since you believe in me, what I am going to do, right, is I am going to demonstrate that I do exist and that I will redeem you. This is a very important concept, the habitochen, which means to hang in there no matter what, you see. And God needs the mitzvah of bitochen from the Jews in order to demonstrate or in order to act out the bitochen, the faith, have, because he reacts to the Jewish people themselves, their actions, you see. So therefore God needs bitochen, right? And therefore what he does is there is so much darkness, right, that we have to have bitochen. In other words, we have nothing left. We know we can't do anything. We know we have nothing to do. So we have to trust in God. So one of the reasons why it gets so dark is because that forces us to make a choice. That we have nobody else to rely on but God. You see? So because if there was a way out, maybe we wouldn't have been talking in God. And we would say, well, maybe we can get out of this by ourselves. You see? But the fact that we are in utter despair means that we, have, we realize that we can do nothing to fix this. And therefore, we must have bitochen. We must have faith. So the darkness itself is the wherewithal that generates the necessity of having faith and trust in God. And that mitzvah is the merit of getting redeemed. You see. And what we have to believe is these ideas. One, that God exists. Number two, is that God will redeem us because He's more powerful than evil but you should know one thing God is not more powerful than evil God has to give permission for evil to even exist because what gives existence to the evil God so could you imagine that God has to create evil give it power to oppose God in other words if God wants there is no such thing as evil 
So he actually has to create the opponent and give it power. That's how, that's how all-encompassing is God. So we have to believe that God, not only God exists, and he's more powerful than evil, right? There is no evil unless God sponsors it, you see? So therefore, the absolute power of God, of course, is, absolute, is totally absolute. Now we find that in Egypt, that's what happened. But the Amsuf, there was somebody called Nachshon ben Aminadav, right? The Jews did not know what to do, and they began to complain. You know, you brought us here because there's no graves in Egypt and so on. So what Nachshon did is he jumped into the Red Sea. And it went all the way up to his nose. And right before it was about to overcome the nose, right, and he would drown, the sea split. So that demonstration of complete reliance and belief in God was the betochen that God needed as the merit to save the Jews, right? That he would now conform to, because that's what they expressed. And Nachshon obviously wasn't the only one, you know. There probably were many people that did have betochen. So we see that betochen is a critical mitzvah, right? That the Jews must do as the ultimate, as the ultimate uh, merit to, uh, to uh, bring the redemption. Uh, so that's the first idea. The second idea why there's tremendous darkness is so a person should make a mistake. Well, it's not God that did it to get us out of this mess. We did it. Our own power. And this is the, uh, the, the mistake of the, for instance, the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, where they think it's their power, you know, their military might and, and so on, you know. Well, you know, it's really us. Okay, God helps us, but really it's us. What a mistake. There is no power other than God, you see. And they are really, they go through the motions of trying to help the Jewish people. But it is God that completely gives them the power to be matzliach, you see. So, God, what God does is brings the Jews to utter despair where they can't make that mistake. So they can't say, well, it's me. No, because it is so bad and so helpless that they realize it's not them at all when there's a Yeshua, when there's a salvation. You see? So part of the darkness is that they should realize, right, that they have contributed nothing to their salvation. Or else why would they be hopeless? That's one of the reasons for the darkness. That they should not make a mistake. That they should realize they have contributed nothing. And that it's purely the power of God to redeem them. <clears throat> then there's a third reason which is very important. Satisfy justice. Because when the Mashiach comes there's a tremendous amount of benefit. Obviously. The whole world changes. But the problem is that there's an enormous amount of sinning that has preceded the messianic entrance. Therefore, God has to satisfy justice. Because the Satan, who defends justice, that's why he was created, is saying, well, you can't bring the Mashiach. They're all sinning, you see. So how can you bring the Mashiach? So God says, you're right. I have to satisfy justice. So all of a sudden, two things happen. One, there has to be a tremendous intensity of suffering, you see, in order to uh, uh, punish the Jews and the world because they will benefit from the messianic entrance. So there's a, a tremendous amount of suffering as part of an expiation, a kapora, you see, atonement, in order to bring the Jews up to the level where they deserve the Mashiach. That is why the darkness includes a tremendous amount of suffering which the world is going through. Especially when you take a look at America in terms of what Biden is doing. Uh, you know? I mean, everybody in America is basically, basically suffering, you know? But the whole world is suffering by what's called, you know, just the confusion and the dominance of evil in the world, all of that engenders suffering, you see. 
Therefore, the darkness, part of the darkness, or the manifestation of darkness, is tremendous suffering. And guess what? One of the major ways of making people suffer is COVID. That's why you have COVID, or one of the major reasons, and to enormously increase the anxiety and the death and the pain of mankind. You see? And by the way, since God wants to bring the Mashiach right away, that is why that pandemic has spread with such enormous speed. Do you ever ask yourself, how did, how did COVID encircle the entire planet? How? Well, without getting into the epidemiology, because God wants to bring the Mashiach now, and therefore the suffering has to encircle the entire planet to satisfy justice, and bring the world up to a state where they basically can deserve the Mashiach because they will have expiated their sins. Yeah, COVID is one of the major factors, and that's why we have COVID. But that's not the only thing that happens. What also happens is the concept that evil dominates, you see, because the Sultan says, wait a minute, why aren't my guys dominating? Because everybody else is sinning. So why should the good dominate, right? Evil should dominate, my guys, right, that want to corrupt the world. So God says, okay, and therefore we find in America there's a tremendous domination control, right, of evil. People who really want to harm other people want to destroy America. And in Israel, evil dominates. The era of Rav dominates, you see, So that's all part of satisfying justice. So not only there's a darkness, which means suffering, tremendous, but also evil dominates as part of this claim of the Sultan that why shouldn't his guys have an ability to rule? And by the way, that's one of the reasons why Tzaddikim, who say that when they die, they will bring the Mashiach, they can't. Because God wants every Jew to be involved in the messianic process and to experience the Mashiach. So when a tzaddik goes over to the Mashiach in heaven and he says, well, why don't you come now? So the Mashiach says, well, if you want, I can come. But you should know, 25% of the Jews won't make it because they have not expiated. They have not satisfied justice. So they, they don't deserve it. So then the tzaddik says, you know, you're right. Don't come now. Let God finish the exact, let God finish the entire plan. That's what has to happen. You see. Uh, So that's why Mashiach doesn't come. Because satisfying justice is a major reason why there's so much darkness. And there's something else that happens, by the way, which is hard to see, but this is really one of the reasons. In order for the Jews to be worthy So not only does suffering have to take place or evil dominates, but God has to lower the par, the bar of Emunah. You know? You know, it's funny. It's like, imagine a city needs engineers. And in order to become an engineer, you've got to get a 90. Let's assume the batch of people that take the test, they can't do more than 75. So what's the city going to do? So what they say is, well, forget about 90, if you get a 75, then you could become an engineer for the city. They lowered the bar of passing. So in a certain sense, God has to lower the bar at the end of time of belief, which is interesting. So it means this, there are many Jews, they don't do mitzvahs, but God has lowered the bar to be part of the Jewish people. How? Well, I believe in Israel. I'm proud I'm Jewish. Even though the person says, you know, I'm not doing the mitzvahs, but because, because God has lowered the bar of a munah, so he says, well, if you believe in Judaism, if you're proud you're Jewish, right, then that is sufficient to be a member of the Jewish people. Of course it determines how much oilam haba you get, but at least it means that you will be part of the Jewish people, you see. And you know where you see this? You see this in Egypt, you see? Because it says that the Jews were redeemed from Egypt for several reasons. 
they need, so the first reason, they needed to identify as a Jew. What was that? They didn't change their language. They didn't change their names. And they didn't change their dress. And that was a minimal. You know, even though they worshipped idols. Because what God did, is He lowered the bar of being a member of the Jewish people so they can be worthy of the redemption. You see. So therefore, what it meant, the bar was, well, at least you have to identify as a Jew. And they do. How? Because they don't change their language. It's Hebrew. They don't speak Egyptian. They had their names, not Egyptian names. And they dressed like Jews. So God said, since you are proud of being Jewish because you identify, therefore I will consider that sufficient belief in Judaism that I could now redeem you. You see? And that is why God did that. You see? So that was the first thing. The second thing that enabled the Jews to be redeemed was no lush and horror. And the rabbis say in the Medrash Chazal that the reason why the Jews were redeemed from Egypt because they did not speak lush and horror. And I'm not going to go into it, but the concept is that if you speak lush and horror, you invoke the judicial process against you. You change your muzzle, measure for measure. You condemn others, therefore the Sutton, right, who represents justice, has the ability to condemn you. It's astounding that Lush and horror, which means harmful speech, actually gives him the ability to go after you and put you in court and prosecute you. So because the Jews really were redeemed before they were really worthy in a certain sense, because they were not yet there 400 years, but only 210. So the Sultan claimed, well, how could you redeem them? They're not there 400 years. So God wanted to quiet the claim of the Sultan. So what he had the Jews do is no lush and horror. You see? And therefore the Sultan cannot claim. Because 95% of the reason why the Sultan can claim against you, or prosecute you, is if you speak lush and horror. So since the Jews did not speak Lashonara, and that's what it says in the Medrash three times, therefore there was no judicial case against the Jews, so God could take them out, even though they had not completed the time that they were supposed to be slaves. In fact, that's why God says in the end, you know, that's why Moshe Rabbeinu says, by the Yamsuf, the Atem Tachrishon, be silent. What do you mean be silent? Don't speak much in horror, because the reason why you're getting out of it is that there's no prosecutions, there's no kitrugam, because you don't speak much in horror, right? So be silent. Don't complain against me and against God, which is much in horror. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu said that. You see, and that's really what happened. So when you have all these things together, that they had an identity of right, they had an identity of being a Jew, right? And not only that, no Lush and horror. And also, they satisfied justice by the decree of straw they were able to get out. You see, it is very interesting. So that's the third reason why that God has to satisfy justice where the Jews deserve, you know, the Messianic era. And then the fourth idea, which then there is, is that God wants to demonstrate that if he lets mankind fulfill completely their evil deeds, that he wants to show everybody that that itself will lead to the destruction of the world. You see, that the only way for society to exist is how? It's by being righteous and holy, you see. But if mankind is left to their designs, then that will destroy the world, because that's what evil does. And when you take a look at America, that's the classic, where the evil leads, the evil dominates. And just take a look, the left, the Democratic Party, Biden, all these crazies, right? They are destroying America. That's the evil that is now dominant, and that will ultimately end America unless God steps in, which he will. So I've provided four reasons why it is tremendously dark and the way it gets dark is by the windows almost closing. But why does it have to be dark for these reasons? And there are other reasons, which I'm not going into. 
But in any case, these four reasons certainly supply the idea. Therefore, we now understand why is it right before the end? Why does it get hopeless? Why is there tremendous despair? And I pointed out, you know, what the despair is really all about and so on. How bad it looks. You know, maybe it doesn't look bad from a guy who's involved in the world, you know, who really is part of the world and so on. But from the person who's a tzaddik or a person who's righteous or holy, right? A person who observes the mitzvahs and the Torah, right? Who wants to do the will of God. You take a look and you say, this is absolutely incredible. It's hopeless. When you think about all the impossibilities, that's what it looks like, right? For the world to change. So this is what God wants. But let me tell you something. It will change. That the hopelessness, just like Egypt was hopeless, tremendous despair, right? Resignation. That will never change. It will change. Could you imagine Moshe Rabbeinu, he's 80 years old, right? He's an old man. Even in those days, 80 years old was an old man, right? Not only that, he ran away, according to Ramban, when he was 26 years old, right? So he's gone for 54 years. And all the Jews were in Egypt, and he was in Ethiopia. So he hadn't seen a Jew, right, for 54 years. Nothing. Never saw them, right? And he's 80 years old. He's an old man. And what is he? He's a shepherd. You know, I mean, what glory is it? And that. Uh, could you imagine the day before the snare? The day before the burning bush? What was he thinking? What is he thinking? Well, it's over. Nothing will change. I'm 80 years old. You know, I'm an old man, really. What could change? There's no hope. I mean, how could he not think that? Right? And he hasn't seen a Jew 54 years, you see. So he probably thought, this is it. He'll die this way, and it's finished. And all of a sudden, the next day, with the burning bush, his life changed. Not only his life changed, his life before that was nothing compared to what his life was after. He became Moshe Rabbeinu, the Redeemer of Israel, the one who brought the Jews to Israel, Eretz Israel, the one who gave them the Torah. It's unbelievable how he elevated the Jews from slaves to unbelievable tzaddikim, right? So you think about that. His life had no meaning before the burning bush. His life started at 80 years old. That's the classic before the redemption. That a person thinks it's over, it'll never change. It's forlorn. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, right? Terrifying, as they say, in the blink of an eye, your life can change. Because that's what God can do. And that's what God wants. He wants you to think that it'll never change. Because He wants you to, like I say, Believe in God, you know, that it could change if God wants. And nobody knows the end of time, what will happen, you know. We just have the, the, the uh, statement of God, so we have to have the bitochem. So what it means is that until it's over, like Yogi Berra, famous ball player, said, it ain't over until it's over, right? As long as you're alive, you never know. It could change in the blink of an eye. Everybody can be elevated. Everybody can be redeemed. And I want to tell you something. That's exactly what's going to happen. The redemption is not going to happen. It will happen gradually once it begins. But the turnaround, the change from evil to good, where the decree of evil is over, and the decree that, evil, that good must be successful, will happen in the blink of an eye. And will be stunned. Then all of a sudden... Everything becomes good. Hatzvacha. Everything succeeds. It's hard to believe. But that will happen in the blink of an eye. Therefore, what I would like to say is, don't give up. Hang in there. And you will experience the incredible transcendence from despair 
to ultimate glory and ultimate exhilaration. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Good. So, you know you spoke about the stages of the hopelessness that the Egyptians went through. Um, yeah. First, they were slaves, and then the Moshe was powerless, and then that the, sea, the Egyptians were behind them when the sea was splitting. Um, yes. Do we go through those stages as well? Yes, which is what I'm saying. What stage are we on? The, well, if you, if you take a look, we can't believe. I want to tell you something. America is the beacon of the world. And America has now constitutionalized immorality. That's what's happened. You can't change that anymore. And I once mentioned that the Medrash says, what sealed the decree of the Mabel, of the flood? You know, we know that they committed sins, which meant that civilization cannot survive. Theft and all kinds of corruption and injustices and so on. But that didn't seal the fate of the flood. What sealed it is what the Medrash says, Pashas Noach. What was it? It says that if a man would marry a man or an animal, a guy married his pet, they would have to write a document, a kasuba. That meant that they were so evil that you would have to document legally the corruption. So God said enough is enough because society cannot exist this way. You see, that's exactly what America has become. They have corrupted themselves, right, in a way which society cannot exist because now it's the in thing, right, to be a homosexual, to be a LGBTQ. It's astounding what's going on. I don't want to dwell on that, but that's what's going on. And the problem is America is a beacon to the entire world, which means this is going to spread throughout the planet. So how could the world exist? You see, so therefore, this is the end. That's the despair. You know, it's one thing, you know, if these things happen, but they're not legalized. But when this stuff is legalized, it's over, because you cannot reverse it. And it's going to spread the discrimination. Where a yeshiva is going to have to hire a homosexual. You see, think about that. What they're doing First, they're trying to kill all the infants with abortion, right? And even though the Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade, it hasn't overturned abortion. It just has re- taken the, the Roe versus Wade or the ability to abort. It has given it over to the state legislatures. But it's still going to happen. That's murder. That's legal, right? So that's number one. Then what they're doing now is in kindergarten. I once heard this. In kindergarten, they now have to read curriculum, right, where they promote self, uh, what do you call it, sexual t- uh, de- deviation, which is okay. You, you can't believe the books that they have to read in kindergarten or second grade. So now they're destroying, not first they kill the youth, the infants, now they're destroying the youth. And then when you get to college, right, all the colleges are left. The professors are liberals and left. They're all a bunch of communism. You realize this, the youth of the world, this is what America's going to look like in 15, 20 years. So this is all legal now. You can't change this. You see, really? So that's despairing because you cannot reverse it. That's the despair. And it's going to spread throughout the entire world. You see. So just like, just like they, they, in Egypt, they, they killed the infants, and now they're trying to right. kill the infants too. Exactly. Right. It's an onslaught against the future, against the youth, straight through colleges, you see? And of course they're trying to do it to society also, you know, where you can't use pronouns that indicate gender, and so on. I mean, this will destroy America. It already is destroying America. You see, I'm not even going into the, the other insanity of this. You see, the inf- I'm not even going into, uh, you know, the immor- not just the immorality, you know, but the crime. The cities are filled with crime. What kind of nonsense is this, you know? You know, defund the police. 
you know, you could walk into a store and steal up to $1,000 in San Francisco or many places, and you're not charged. They don't even bother arresting you. That's mamish gizela. This is the marble, the flood, right? The generation of the flood, where you can go into a store and steal, right, up to $1,000, and they won't touch you, right? That's incredible. That means there's no more justice. That's exactly what happened in the generation of the flood. In fact, we're looking at a repeat. We are looking at a repeat of the generation of the flood. And we know what God did. He wiped out those people. Killed. Imagine what it took for God to destroy the planet. Imagine how evil the planet had to be to do that. I mean, that's the greatest extreme punishment that God has ever done. He wiped out mankind. Just think about why would he do that? And America has now replicated that evil, you see. That's the despair. Because when you look at a society that is a beacon to the world, that where it cannot be reversed, and they have become insane, immorally, theft, right? And they all break, and they break the law. I mean, Biden is breaking the law of immigration by allowing all these people in without vetting them. It's incredible. He is really breaking the law. Of course he says, no, he's doing it slowly. But really he's breaking the law. You see, the whole society is lawless. Where now felonies are reduced to misdemeanors. Guys are walking around murdering because they know nothing will happen to them. You know? You know what the Pirkei uh, says, right? That in Moli Mura Malchus, if it wasn't for the fear of the kingdom, which is ju- that the kingdom is just, right? They would swallow you whole while you're alive. Belohu or Chayim. And that's exactly what's happening, right? So without justice, the rampant spread of crime, total immorality, Craziness in the population of the youth, children, infants, embryos, students in college, everybody. And, you know, and just take a look at the social media between Twitter and, and Facebook, right? Google, all of these, right? They're all for corruption. And they influence people. Not only that, what about the media and the corporations? Right? The media is all against righteousness. They all support, right, corruption, injustice, evil. Talk about the media, New York Times and so on. So a guy looks at them and says, wow, this is an army of evil. So you, it's despairing. How do you change this? Because they are affecting the fabric of American society, which will ultimately spread to the entire world. This is not just America. We take a look at Israel. Tragically, they have these gay pride parades, right? Israel is, a, is, is you know, it's a small America. You know, Israel is always trying to imitate America. That's part of the problem. You know, that's what they aspire to, imitate America. The corruption of America is going to spread to Israel. It's going to spread to Europe everywhere, if not already in Europe and so on, you know. Uh, you know, so America is not just America. Where America goes is the world. And like Abraham Lincoln once said, America is the last great hope of mankind. And he was right. Why? Because America influences mankind. And if America has gone, right, then the world is finished. Just take a look. Because of Biden's incredible weakness. That's why China and Russia and Iran and North Korea think that they can get away with what they're doing. And they're doing nuclear. We're not talking here about conventional warfare. These are nuclear powers. You see? And the reason why they're doing what they do is because of Biden. Because Biden is a very weak person. I'm not even going into the fact that the man is, you know, is cognitively dysfunctional and so on and so forth. But they all re- realize 
And now is their time. They're not afraid of the policeman on the block, which is America. You see? Uh, so you look around the evil of the world, and you realize it's over. There's no way to change this, because it has become legalized. It has become pervasive. It has become constitutionalized. How are you going to change it? And the answer is, you're not. <clears throat> that is the greatest indication that we are right up against the Messianic era. Because God, once we've imitated, replicated the marble, God is not going to allow this to continue. Because God will not allow to continue any kind of crime or situation which will destroy the human race. And just like the marble, the people of the flood, destroyed the human race in the eyes of God, He's going to end it. But the way he's going to end it is by making everybody suffer the darkness for the reasons that I've mentioned and he's going to bring them a Shiach. Now. Any other questions? Yeah, so Mike, I have a question. So when we were talking about um, Lashon Hara, um, we were talking about how, um, uh, how the Satan could have a claim on us um, and that if we Lashon Hara... But if we complain, is that technically speaking Lashon Hara about Hashem? Or complaining about what He's... Yes, oh yeah, that's Lashon Hara against God, of course. Yeah, so you're speaking Lashon Hara against God, sure. Complaining is a Lashon Hara against Hashem. Is that a worse, is that a more severe than speaking of His child, or no? Yes, yes, because when you denigrate God, that's bad news. Because belief in God is a fundamental, uh, you know, uh, pillar of attaining righteousness. And when you denigrate God, in its essence, you're saying that not only there's something wrong with God, but that means you don't have to observe his mitzvahs. You see, you are undermining the whole basis of holiness and righteousness and Torah observance. That's what happens. And, of course, that's much worse you see, you know, yeah, I just want to mention one thing, which I forgot, that I, I, I have dedicated this year, if I want to say it openly, to Rini Mokoi, Regina Bas Yosef Ruvain, that it should be from Alias Neshama of this person. Okay, any other questions? Um, one second. Okay, so when we were talking about the 17th of Tammuz, um, yes. and saying that um, it was the day that, Mashiach, uh, that Moshe wasn't able to be the Mashiach Ben Yosef. Right, because so, of the Chet Ego, right. Right. So, then, so what, what does this day entail? What is the power of the day that we should be focused on? Um, Tshuva. The power of the day is to accept the mitzvahs, tshuva, repentance, that's what it is. Which really means repentance to get back to spirituality. Because in the end, you know, the real tshuva that a person has to do, you have to realize this, there are two concepts of tshuva. You can repent on a, on a sin, a specific sin, or you can repent on sinning, you see, but what you really have to repent is on what's called commitment. That you want to commit to join or to be part of the whole concept of what Judaism says. That is to do the will of God. Doing the will of God is much greater than just a mitzvah or mitzvah. Because the will of God in, 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 uh, in, uh, includes many things. You know, in terms of Tikkun Hamidus, to character development, you see, and, uh, and so many other things, you know, um, and so on, you know. So real repentance has to be, you know, to want to come together or get back to God, you see. It's really all about God. This world is all about God. It's not about us. And therefore, your life has to be completely immersed 
in God and to do what He wants, which of course is to do the mitzvahs. And more than that, you see, that's the real tshuva. And I once mentioned the Raiva, the Raiva is Rab, of Roham ben Dovid, what's called the Bapluk of the Rambam, the one who is the, writes the uh, criti- critiques against the Rambam. And he writes that when God judges a person, what is he looking for? So it's, you know, so he's, it's not just that he's saying, well, you did this sin and that sin. We're not talking about adding up sins. Uh, what he wants is a person to commit. Are you with me or against me? You know, it's like Moshe Rabbeinu by the Chet Ego, by the sin of the golden calf. You know, he didn't say, well, who regrets, you know, uh, allowing these people to do the sin of the golden calf? He didn't say that. Notice, he said, Mila Hashem Eli, who is with God, come to my side. That's what he said. In other words, are you with God or are you not with God? He didn't even refer to the sin of the golden calf. He didn't say, well, who, is, who regrets, like I said, the golden calf? Right? Because that was the sin. Why didn't he say that? Because the critical thing is not the sin in and of itself. It's what does this indicate about where you think you belong? Are you with God or not? Of course you can sin, you're going to sin, you know, but that's not the major, you know, the major fault. It's, are you with the, did you make a commitment that you want to be a member of the society of God or not? You see, and you see that from Moshe Rabbeinu. That was his language. So that's what I would say. Shiva Asabatamas is that time, like Moshe Rabbeinu said, Right? Who is with God and who is not? So I would say that statement by Moshe Rabbeinu on Shiva Subhatamas is the main statement, is the main thought of what to do on Shiva Subhatamas, which of course ushers in the three weeks. It's a different way of looking at it. It's not looking at a specific sin. It's looking at, are you a member of the society of God or not? And therefore, of course, you're going to strive to do the mitzvahs. It's obvious because that's what the membership entails. You know? It's like, are you a member of this group or not? Of course, if you're a member of the group, right, then you have to observe the rules of the group. But it's not so much the rules of the group. Are you part of the society or the organization? You see what I'm saying? Same thing with Judaism. Are you part of the organization? Are you part of the society of God? That's the critical idea. If you are, of course, you're going to strive to observe the rules. You see what I'm saying? So I would say, that's the tshuva. Me, Vashem, who is the God? A lie, come to me. There you are. Anything else? How old was Moshe when he passed away? Moshe was exactly 120 years old. He was born on Zayin Ado. He died on Zayin Ado. The seventh day of Ado, he was born. And he died on the seventh day of Ado. Exactly 120 years. You see. What does that entail when, you, when somebody passes, is born, passes away at the same time? Full circle? It, it usually means it's tzaddik. Yeah. Uh, if somebody dies the day that he was born... That's called a shlemus. That's a called a completion. You know, he really fulfilled all his years. Usually in the case of a tzaddik. Yeah, oh yeah. And there are people that do that. It's not common, obviously, to be born and die on the same day. But believe me, it means in many ways, you are a righteous person. You see? Oh. That doesn't mean a guy has to commit suicide on the day he was born. Right? I mean, obviously not. I mean, you can imagine a guy saying, well, I'm going to kill myself, but it's going to be on the day I was born so I can be a tzaddik. Right? I mean, that's humorous, but uh, obviously, you know what I'm saying? 